Um, anyway, this is a very, very short snippet of a talk I usually kind of give like at GDC and all these other places. But essentially, um, what I do for a living is content culturalization. So I, even though I run the localization SIG, um, I, I'm not a translator. I don't do translation work. What I do is I focus specifically on geopolitical and cultural issues that might be a problem not only in games, but in other stuff as well. So like, for example, Google, I work with Google on Google Maps, on boundaries and place names and all kinds of complicated nastiness. So, but my heart is in games. I love games. The game content is very dynamic and very challenging. So I'm going to talk about just um, what I consider to be the top five areas of uh, cultural risk or the top issues that pop up in games. But I want to remind people that there's two audiences that we typically deal with. So this is helpful to keep in mind as, as I go through these. Um, so the intended audience, basically game players. We also have the unintended audience, where, which are basically all those people who tend to comment on games and they s form opinions about games, but they have no experience with game content or very little experience or they, their experience is whatever the media t you know, shows them is the game content. So. Typically, the reaction with when a game is released and if it has sensitive issues in it, the crowd on the left here, the intended audience, all they care about are two things. Does the game rock or does it suck? That's it. The people on the right are the ones who will say it's offensive, it's problematic, it needs to be regulated, we need laws against this stuff. And so this is a, a, a very important dynamic to keep in mind in, around this stuff. Also, just a basic definition. I can talk a, for hours about what culture really is and the broad definition of culture. To me, as someone working in the game industry or, or in digital content, I view culture as essentially uh, accumulated managed content of a specific content. So in other words, culture can be, um, is essentially a set of content assets. Because when we create a game, a game is, is comprised of content assets that make the sound, the look, the feel. I mean, we're not up to taste and smell yet, but um, you know, we're kind of getting there a little bit with things like Connect. But um, culture can be defined the same way. Every culture, like my background is Scottish. Um, I know Luke is in here. I don't, I'm not going to offend the, the, the culture. But if I say Scottish, what comes to most people's minds? Probably the stereotype of kilts, bagpipes, haggis, and all that kind of stuff, which obviously does not define modern Scottish culture, but those are kind of icons of what people view as Scotland and Scottish culture. So, but, but my point is that those things are all content assets. They're look, they're the feel, they're objects that basically make up that culture. So um, when we're creating game worlds, what we're dealing with are local worldviews of the, of the gamers that we're distributing the products to. And this, this applies whether they're in the United States, Canada, North America, or anywhere else in the world. We all have a worldview that, that has shaped us. I'm from Southern California. I can trust me, my worldview is a lot different from people who grew up in Seattle. So, um, and I'm proud of that. But, um, <laughs> but basically what we're doing when we culturalize content, it's really kind of a gene splicing exercise to create um, culturalized content, um, which is your hope at the bottom, which basically means you're creating content that is going to be compatible with the expectations of those people. Now, that doesn't mean you do everything to appeal to them and, and, you know, and not to appeal to other people, but basically you have to keep these factors in mind because there are some things that pop up, which are the five things I'm going to talk about, which can disrupt this process and basically become like a virus that tears the DNA apart. And so when you get this splicing going, that's where we have this zone of incompatibility or compatibility um, that takes place. So the top five factors, history, um, sacred versus secular issues, which is basically religion, inclusion versus exclusion issues, which often focuses around ethnicity, um, intercultural dissonance, which I'll explain in a minute, and geopolitical imaginations, as I call them. And I'm going to describe these through examples. So the point here is that any game that has historical content related to the real world can be a potential problem because um, the long and short tail of history is very persistent in different cultures. So for example, here in Age of Empires, you can see here, this is a real scenario that happened where the Yamotos in Japan invaded the Korean Peninsula. And this is the Chozon Empire back in the Middle Ages. This is what really happened. This is what historians tell us. 
And so um, when the game was released in Korea, the Korean government said that didn't happen that way. And so in order to release Age of Empires, in, and, and as we all know, Korea is very big on RTS games, as StarCraft later proved, um, basically the Korean government Ministry of Information required us to change the scenario so that you can see dramatically the, the Choson Empire invaded Japan, which is amazing. Um, and so, um, you know, basically that was, that was a requirement of the government to sell the game because their historical vision of that incident was completely different. And this is something from many centuries ago, whereas then we have things like this, Six Days in Fallujah, which a lot of us know about when this game was designed, which takes place, it's basically a recreation of the, of the very kind of bloody and controversial battle in 2004 in the Iraq War and Konami decided not to publish this because once the public heard about this game, a lot of people were starting to get really upset that why would you make a game about this incident? And, and honestly, this took place a few years ago and it's very sensitive. And like somewhere up here in Seattle where you've got a lot of military personnel, some of whom were involved in this incident. We've got the, the Lewis McCord base down south near Tacoma and all that. And so it's, you know, they, one of the things they could have done here is not make it Fallujah. They could have made it a fictional city in Iraq and just change the name, but not necessarily the scenario. So it, you kind of make that distance from the actual incident. But they didn't do that because part of their, their goal here was to be, you know, make an honest recreation. But basically the marketplace was not ready for this because it's just too recent in memory. Um, Sacred versus secular issues. Basically, when we have cultures that base their, their expectations on religious beliefs, um, we're going to have a different dynamic in terms of what kind of content will or won't be uh, acceptable. So like in Fallout 3, this one issue prevented the game from being released in India. And the reason is being that this is a Brahmin bull, which is sacred to Hinduism. And there's actual laws in India that protect Brahmin bulls from being harmed, real ones anyway, not virtual. but. Um, the point is that it's a sensitive issue, but here in Fallout 3 you have a two-headed Brahmin bull that can be eaten and it's radioactive and it's all kind of uh, madness. Um, you know, my poor Photoshop skills, they could have done a two-headed horse, they could have done a two-headed giraffe or anything, but um, unfortunately the developer did not code the product so that they could easily swap out that one graphic element and make it accessible to India. So basically India lost out on this particular game. Um, Another issue in, in Resistance Fall of Man, the, they recreated the Manchester Cathedral in the, in the UK brilliantly, um, but they took the gameplay into the cathedral and the cathedral got really kind of beaten up and destroyed and all that because of the gameplay. And the Church of England no, had no idea that this had been recreated. And so they got upset about this, which basically led the church to create what they call sacred digital guidelines. So now if you're gonna use one of their structures, no matter where it is in the UK, they want you to follow these guidelines, get permission, and, and you know, so they can basically approve the use of the building in, their, in the game. In Hitman 2, this is the Golden Temple in Amritsar, India, which is the, the, the center of the Sikh religion. And Hitman 2 got a lot of, uh, a lot of flack for the, you can see here he is fighting against Sikhs in the Golden Temple itself. And um, that's not very cool. That's like having, you know, showing a game player go into Mecca around the Kabbalah or something and start, you know, sh open fire. It's not very cool. Um, inclusion versus exclusion. So when you have a perceived inequitable treatment of different cultures or ethnicities, nationalities, and, on and so on and so forth, this is a really fundamental issue because we'll see things where a lot of us know this example where this imagery, when the game before Resident Evil 5 was released, this imagery was very problematic because you can see, you know, this white guy armed going into a sub-Saharan African village and gunning down the, the people there. And, you know, the, the developer's defense is like, well, they're zombies. Why wouldn't he? It's like, but that's not the point because it evokes imagery from history that is very negative and very problematic. You know, the notions of the dark continent and the great white hunter and all those other things that come up. And so this is one of those things where the developer was just, you know, not really thinking of that particular issue. Another one is something as simple as like Pocket God, um, if you've played this game. And so you can see these little natives here with their, you know, dark skin and the grass skirts and the bone in their hair. It's a very, again, stereotypical image of what the native is. This is the kind of image we would see in cartoons in the early 20th century because that back then was 
funny to them. And the problem with this, you know, and if you haven't played this game, basically you torture these poor people. So, um, but the problem here is that the developer said this does not represent a specific culture, which is absolutely incorrect because that stone head comes from, <laughs> it's, a, it's a moai and it's only found on Easter Island which definitely pegs this, at least in this particular version of the game, it pegs this culture very specifically. And so um, that's a very poor defense on their part. And so, um, this kind of, and so you know, naturally Polynesian groups were upset about this and they complained about it to the developer. Um, of course, they didn't change anything either because um, this game has been radically successful. Um, intercultural dissonance this is kind of a general tension that happens between cultures and nationalities on all, all kinds of issues, some of which could be related to history or ethnicity or other issues. Um, in this example here in Age of Empires, um, back in 1999, this box art that was used for Age of Empires 2, the Korean retailers were very reticent to put this on the shelf. And the reason is because of the Japanese samurai being on the box. Now, part of the context to set the geopolitical context here is that one of the reasons it was sensitive in 1999 is because that was during one of the big flare-ups between Korea and Japan over Dokdo Takashima, which is a disputed rock in the middle of the Sea of Japan, or East Sea if you're Korean. Um, and so because of that flare-up of the issue, that was kind of one of the ways that the retailer was protesting against the whole issue and saying, we're not going to put anything on the shelf that has a Japanese you know, samurai on it. And so kind of to make up for it, when the um, expansion pack was released, most of the world saw that one with the Aztec warrior in the middle, whereas in Korea you can see they added a Korean uh, soldier right front and center to kind of, in a way, sort of make up for this fiasco. So um, it's kind of interesting the way they, they did that. So then geopolitical imagination. So um, some governments like to really reinforce their national sovereignty and territorial integrity, and usually that's done uh, cartographically. So in something like Hearts of Iron 1 and 2, the world was kind of divided up in like a risk board, sort of somewhat arbitrarily. But the problem with uh, the Chinese government saw here is that Tibet and Taiwan were not being shown as wholly a part of, of uh, China. And um, the, the bigger problem here is that this game takes place during World War II. The PRC did not exist yet. And so we have a case where the Chinese government is basically reinforcing their sovereignty in perpetuity into the past, even when they did not technically exist. And so you get issues like that that crop up, and uh, there's, it's, it's hard to predict that sometime. And then we had in Korea, Ghost Recon and Mercenaries was originally banned because they portrayed North Korea as a villain. And the South Korean government was really not keen on that. Um, things have changed a bit since then because of incidents with North Korea. And in 2007, Korea, South Korean gamers protested against the government and said, this is a free speech issue. And eventually, the government agreed. So you can actually play these games in Korea now. Um, just a few quick points to close up. So you really, it's really about anticipating local expectations. We have to remember that gamers are communities these days. And so they can be dynamic rallying points for backlash or praise. Um, they can even overthrow governments, as we've seen in Arab Spring. So we really have to be mindful of this dynamic these days. You need to assume that your content's going to be instantly global. It doesn't matter if you're targeting like you know this market and that market. Every piece of digital content, when it's released, is ubiquitous. It's everywhere in the world, whether you want it to be or not. And you are always guilty. There's never a case where they're going to come back and say, it's OK, we know you didn't mean it. If you make an offense like this, I can guarantee you from my 20 years of experience doing this stuff, they will come back and ask you, why did you do this to us? What was your point in offending us like this? And then finally, at 2 PM today, if you're more interested in localization issues right next door, there's going to be a panel session that I'm running. So there you go. Question. Oh, the fourth issue? It was uh, inclusion, exclusion. Oh, intercultural dissonance. That's it, thank you. Sure. <laughs> so what would a company, what do you suggest a company do if they find themselves under one of these situations? Besides hire me, the <laughs> issue. <laughs> Actually no, hire you. Yeah. <laughs> no, the, the, what they need to do is, first of all, just like Hitchhiker's Guide, don't panic. <laughs> 
because one of the things, biggest mistakes I've seen companies do is that when they get one of these kind of feedback, like from a government or a certain group, they do a knee-jerk change. They just change the content and then they say, there you go, we fixed it for you. But what they often don't realize is that that one change might offend the country next door or offend another culture. And so now it's like, well, okay, so we appease this group here, but then, oh, we just, uh, we just pissed off 750 million people next door. And so that's a, that you basically have to just stand back, look at, you know, really kind of ingest what they're saying, what they're telling you to do, and do your research. And what I often tell developers is if nothing else, if you know you have content that might be potentially sensitive, you need to be ready to defend it and, and show them, you know, even if it's a brief explanation saying, look, we did our research, we consulted these sources, we talked to this professor, whatever, and we've determined that we felt this was the right thing to do um, for, for the purpose of our game. And I've often found that an explanation like that can go, um, it can go somewhat far in helping to, you know, kind of mitigate a little bit because a lot of developers I've seen, if they get some kind of backlash from the government or a particular interest group or something, they'll say, well, we thought it was cool. It's like, that's, that's, that's suicide. I mean, that's not gonna work. So you really have to kind of, you know, basically respond, really listen and respond to them and you be apologetic. I mean, that's the biggest problem. I've seen game developers where they're just arrogant about it. You know, they're like, well, this is our creative vision. You know, you can take it or leave it. If you don't like it, we don't need to sell it here. You know, and that's when the government says, well, great, then we will basically ban every product that your company releases in the future. How about that? So, you know, we have to appease the, the, the force that controls the means of distribution. That's part of the issue here. So anyway, I'm done. Thanks. All right, thanks.